Greetings, everyone. My name is Jack Neely. I'm one of the engineers at 42 Lines. Uh, with me today is Jared Watkins as well. Uh, I asked him to tag along and sort of help out with uh, questions and managing Q&A and stuff. So if you have questions, uh, please feel free to stick them in Q&A or chat. And if they're on topic and pertinent, uh, Jared will interrupt me with the, on the presentation and we'll try to address those. Otherwise, we'll probably take most of them after the presentation. So again, I'm with 42 Lines. Jared is with 42 Lines. Uh, we've spent no small amount of time with a, a small company that you might have heard about uh, called Fitbit, um, where we've done a lot of visibility and observability work for that company. And we've worked with them uh, since they were a 50 person startup to IPO and now as they look forward to completing their acquisition with Google. Um, so if you're interested in about uh, what 42 Lines can bring to your company, what we can bring to the table, uh, please feel free to send me an email um, or stop by our booth uh, in the exhibit hall and feel free to ask questions. Questions are totally free and so are answers. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Prometheus, finding the golden signals with Prometheus, some stories about scaling Prometheus, and things to think about as your company grows on your Prometheus monitoring platform. So Prometheus needs no introduction. It's an incredibly popular time series database for monitoring and alerting, often or most often paired with Grafana. In fact, I find it really hard to think about some of the competitors in this space that's, that's not a SaaS vendor because Prometheus has become really the de facto solution, uh, especially as we do cloud native work, uh, working more, moving workloads toward Kubernetes and adopting that, that next generation of, of working in the cloud. There are plenty of of competitors out there. Um, I want to point out Victoria Metrics because they probably the only other open source alternative that has some of the same simplicity that Prometheus has. Being you can stand up Prometheus literally in minutes, start gathering intelligence and start making analytical decisions incredibly quickly, which really makes it very powerful. Back in August, Google released a paper on their internal uh, planet-wide time series monitoring tool, which is called Monarch. That paper detailed their transition from Borgmon to Monarch, and Borgmon was the inspiration uh, to Prometheus. So Google, of course, has moved on. There are, there are bigger and better things out there as well. And they outlined in this paper um, four main points about Borgmon that really apply to Prometheus. And I'm reading this paper and thinking, this is exactly what I'm trying to get at in my presentation for today. The first big point in the Monarch paper was Prometheus's or Borgmon's distributed nature. The fact that you end up with a Prometheus per application team, so you end up with people on each team have to be a Prometheus and monitoring and statistics expert to get the best out of it. Secondly, Borgmon and Prometheus don't have any sort of, of hard schema. So now that you have each team with their own Prometheus, each set of labels, each team's implementation of metric names varies, sometimes in subtle ways. And when you get to a point where one team needs to ask a analytical question from another team, their Prometheus doesn't really speak the same language. It's difficult for teams to work together. The third big point in the Monarch paper was that Borgmon had a, a lack of support for uh, generating statistical models, dealing with uh, timers and size objects. Um, we solved this with Prometheus with the histogram data type. But Prometheus's histograms leave much to be desired. So I'm going to go over some a cheater methods to how to work around some of the shortcomings there. Finally, hey, uh, the fourth Jack, yeah, are, Jared. You, are your slides moving? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Um, the fourth point in the Monarch paper is about sharding, which happens to Prometheus as well. Um, that is truly another presentation, so we'll save that for a later day. But changing slides now, um, what we're going to talk about today is how to build some methods of common instrumentation. How do we handle the lack of schema? We're going to talk about uh, doing service level objectives, setting those goals, using Prometheus to monitor them, and how to get some more accurate data and what to look at uh, when using Prometheus for those SRE kinds of, of goal setting and measurement. And finally, on our journey, we're going to talk about how do we do effective alerting in sort of that uh, site reliability mentality, building on top of our service level objectives. So that's kind of my introduction about where I am and where I've come from. Um, I've wanted to talk about this for a long time. There are the initial problems with working with Prometheus, with scaling Prometheus, is really kind of a social problem. It's the fact that we need to build some sort of common understanding that we can use in place of a schema. So the best way I found to go about this is bring your teams together, bring your developers, your visibility teams, your SRE teams, maybe just one or two teams, but have a plan for how you're going to use Prometheus. Better yet, uh, and especially if you're working with microservices, build some sort of a kit that you can use as a starting point for each new microservice or each time you write a new script or some new service. And that kit has Prometheus, the, the, the Prometheus client library already integrated, some key standard metrics that you know you're going to use to instrument HTTP API calls, for example, and some good examples already coded in so you're starting on the ground running. Create and encourage a consistent use of metric names as well. You can definitely start with the Prometheus naming best practices as a guide here. There's tons of information there about how to form uh, best practices around naming metrics, naming labels. Um, and one thing you definitely want to look at is how do you label metrics consistently so you have that schema of you know which team generated this metric, you know where it came from, which Kubernetes cluster, which pod, etc. Ideally, you want to be able to run PromQL queries like we have on the screen. If most of what you have, if what you're working with is HTTP requests, HTTP APIs, then there should be one simple query that can generate the traffic rate of all services in your fleet. And you can use that as you know a top level Grafana dashboard that you can drill down from. And since we're summing by job, we can see traffic rate per service together on the same graph. And that's a really powerful concept that because of Prometheus's distributed nature, sometimes we miss out on. Don't think of this as you know, a social burden to be fixed. This is one of the opportunities we have as site reliability engineers to help encourage a culture of, well, DevOps, frankly, having a kit, having the schema breaks down silos that naturally build up between teams and enables us to change teams, to look at each team for managers and C-level folks to look at each team and understand what does health mean. And so that really helps build that DevOps culture that we're all sort of striving for. When you're building your kit and, and making some of these decisions, use one of these standard methods to, to inform some of your decisions. Uh, Brendan Gregg started this uh, concept in 2012 with the use method. That focuses more toward hardware and resources. I've done a bunch more work in the application space. So the red method makes more sense to me. The red method, um, Tom Wilkie started blogging about this in about 2015, so not too many years ago, aimed at services APIs like a a microservice style architecture. Red stands for the traffic rate, the error rate, and the duration of those API calls. 
clearly when Google was building up their internal SRE teams, they were thinking along the same lines. Um, Waldo did an earlier talk yesterday about um, some great tenants of SRE, and he talked about this as well. Um, the Google Site Reliability Engineering book came out in 2016, and that introduced us to some of the concepts that Google was using internally. And one of those concepts is called the four golden signals, which stands for traffic, latency, errors, and saturation. So four common signals that you want to measure from each and every application. And basically, it's the red method plus saturation from the use method. Okay, so once you've identified a method and that's part of your kit to use, some templating and automation start to naturally fall out of this. The idea is that all of your applications export some common Prometheus metrics that are named the same, that follow the same naming scheme or schema that, outs, that underscore the latency, the traffic, the errors, and the saturation. If you're working with a third party application where you have less control over the instrumentation, maybe this is a layer of recording rules on top of the existing instrumentation. But a traffic or a, a latency signal um, immediately can become a performance SLO. Using traffic and errors helps us engineers identify you know, where problems lie when they arise but you can combine those signals into a ratio, which gives you availability or uptime, which you can also measure as an SLO. Saturation is always the hardest signal to deal with. In fact, a lot of people use the red method um, because saturation can be more challenging to deal with. Saturation indicates how full your service is at present and obviously has uh, indications for capacity planning as we you know, look at the upcoming holidays. How, how many devices have we sold? How much do we think we're going to grow? What resources do we need to spin up to increase our fleet to be able to handle the incoming demand? So that leads me to kind of uh, a preferred workflow for working with Prometheus and Grafana. And the goal here is to reduce the cognitive burden of each team having to be an expert in, in telemetry and statistics uh, to run their own monitoring. And what I found works best is working through an SRE abstraction layer, where we're thinking in terms of our service level indicators. Those are the signals in our method, uh, setting goals for them to build SLOs and using Slack ops, Git ops, or some sort of CLI tool that perhaps uploads some, some YAML somewhere that expresses, you know, I want traffic to be two seconds or less for 95% of the time. And that little bit of information goes into a, a code generation or a templating engine that uses your recording rule libraries that you've built and renders out Prometheus and Grafana uh, dashboards, alerts, and other things you use to monitor your application, even custom dashboards as well. You stick those in some sort of, of API accessible place like um, S3, uh, maybe GCS if you're uh, using the Google Cloud. And the storage objects generate a notification, Prometheus receives the notification, pulls down its new configuration. And within a couple seconds, you're working with a brand new configuration based on the changes in your goals that that you just submitted a few minutes ago. So to me, this abstraction layer works really well to offload some of that cognitive burden, to encourage us to use schema and namespaces and recording rule libraries as well. Um, sort of in a Kubernetes sense, the templating layer, you know, think of this as, as a Kubernetes control plane tool object um, that reacts to state changes that it monitors externally it sees a state change, it pushes updated information to your Prometheus operator, which makes configuration changes to your Prometheus uh, pods running in production.
So let's look a little more closely at working with service level objectives and Prometheus. So if you're familiar with uh, site reliability engineering and doing service level objectives, this comes as no surprise. A service level objective is about four things. You have your service level indicator, usually you know, a signal from your method. You have a threshold or you know what, what target are you aiming for? Um, this can be one of two classes. If you're dealing with latency or sizes, you have a static value, like you want latencies to be two seconds or under. In some cases, you can use a Boolean value here, which simplifies some of the math. When folks start with service level, service level objectives, I tell them to you know, start with a 95% availability goal. Um, that probably doesn't represent where you want to be long term, um, but it's a great starting place. It lets you model out the SLOs and really see where you are today uh, compared to you know, a, a first iteration SLO. And of course, we can iterate on this you know, as we uh, tune our inputs. And finally, the time window that's associated with a service level objective is really critically important and sometimes overlooked. Um, more formal SLOs tend to be in the 30 day range. I've definitely worked with shorter SLOs as well. Uh, but that time definition means that another person on your team can reproduce your SLO math, or perhaps your customers can reproduce your SLO math. And we can have peer verification that, yeah, we are in fact meeting our service level objective goals. So that's an important part. You'll see SLOs phrased um, sort of like some of these examples, like a service will return an HTTP API result within two seconds or less for 95% of requests over the trailing 30 days, or perhaps over the calendar month. And when you can articulate SLOs in that fashion, they fit really nicely into our telemetry systems like Prometheus, and they work through our templating engine to help make some of this easier. Looking at some example here, um, this is an availability ratio. So this is a Boolean state, either the HTTP request responded in a healthy manner, or we responded in an error and the customer's angry. So since this is a Boolean, we can simplify this to a ratio of requests that were, um, that were healthy over the total number of requests. And you can see here we are normalizing uh, per second, but we're looking back 30 days. So we build that 30 day SLO window. We are summing by job, which means that any service that exports this metric and conforms to our naming scheme, this rule will work with. And we build a recording rule um, that stores the available availability ratio for the rolling 30 days. We can take the results of that recording rule, stick that into an alert rule, and simply ask the question, is that uh, availability ratio for the past 30 days ever less than 0.95 or 95%. That means we've broken our SLO. The next example uh, is latency. So we have that value of we want to be two seconds or under for 95% of, of our requests. So this is pretty similar. We'll, we are building a recording rule that stores the 95th percentile of all requests over the last 30 days. So that is the duration that 95% of requests are either equal to or less than. Um, so if this was two seconds, we know that 95% of our requests have been served in two seconds or less. But again, since we're uh, dealing with latencies, we store this information in a histogram. So we use Prometheus's histogram quantile function to do the, the percentile estimation. Again, we're summing by job. So importantly, we can reuse this rule for any application that exports signals in these common formats. Once we've got our uh, recording rule set up, 
we can put the output into an alert rule and we simply ask the question, is our uh, 95th percentile duration for the last 30 days ever greater than two or two seconds? If it is, we know we have a problem with our SLO. But wait, histograms, Prometheus, I keep indicating that, that they're somehow problematic. So let's look a little closer at Prometheus's histograms. When I was trying to understand this myself, um, I took a data set from my old graphite cluster um, and just a data set of, of query latencies for 10,000 queries. I threw this into R and modeled some histograms around it. And this, these are the outputs. Um, so in this case, most of my uh, graphite responses happen in really close to zero seconds. I've got buckets every 0.2 seconds, so five buckets uh, per second. And clearly from the graph, a large majority of them happen, you know, really quite quickly. So this looks good, right? Well, my tail is really long. In fact, my tail extends out to 29 seconds. And I've actually cut off the graph so it fits on the screen. I've measured where the average is at 0.29, I've measured the standard deviation at 0.733. So I know already that since my data doesn't lie within three or four standard deviations of the mean, that this isn't a normal distribution. And this is exactly why we don't use averages to look at latency information, because averages are meant to work with normal distributions and latencies, download sizes, rarely, rarely are. In fact, they're usually gamma distributions. I've used R to sort of plot out where the 95th percentile is as sort of my reference value. So if Prometheus were to have a histogram like this, then what does it look like? And so you're thinking, OK, I can make buckets every 0.2 seconds and feed that information into Prometheus and ask Prometheus to generate the 95th percentile. There are 10,000 samples, so we're going to use the value of the 9,501st. We know provably that that sample value is in the eighth bucket. And Prometheus uses some linear approximation across that bucket to fine tune where, that, where exactly uh, that sample would be in the bucket to give us our estimate. But again, this histogram extends out to 29 seconds. If I were smart enough to know to stop at 29 seconds, that means there's 144 buckets here. And this is an R model I've built on top of the data I had. When we're working with Prometheus, we build our instrumentation and our histograms before we've seen the data. So that leads us to histograms inside Prometheus that kind of look like this. When we build histogram implementa uh, instrumentation in our code, we specify a, a bucketing scheme to use. And we might use something like 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 1, 5, some sort of, of numerical pattern there. Those are super common. What this ends up doing, especially as us humans you know, code this in by hand, is we have more buckets where we think a majority of the data will be and fewer wider buckets where the tails will be. But it's the tails that is where the important data is. That's, that's the behavior we wanna analyze and understand. So understanding the tail is really quite frankly more important than where the majority of our data is. So it's not uncommon to find errors in Prometheus's uh, percentile estimation of 200 or 300%. And that's not cool. That's not cool at all. So what would I like to see? I'd really like to see something like a logarithmic uh, bucketing algorithm in Prometheus. This doesn't exist. But if we had an algorithm that generated our buckets for us, our buckets would be finer, therefore increasing our accuracy. All of our histograms would have the same bucketing scheme 
and all of our histograms would be aggregatable because if the bucketing varies, they're not very aggregatable. And just looking at that same data through a logarithmic approach, and there's so much more story there. You can tell the data is multimodal. You, there's obviously three different classes of queries that are happening here. In fact, the 95th percentile outlines this entire query class that I probably want to dig into and figure out what's going on there. This is the power of histograms that Prometheus kind of misses the boat on. So how do we work around this? Well, I suggest we cheat. If you're not cheating, you're not trying hard enough, right? If you read the Prometheus best practices, they suggest you use your SLO threshold as a bucket boundary in your histogram. So your application already knows that. So I suggest go ahead and build a metric around that uh, so you know what it is and you can track it when it changes. Instead of a histogram, use these three counters. Count the total number of requests, count the total number of requests that resulted in an error, count the total number of requests that took longer than your SLO goal to process. You can add some additional labels here so you can play with a little bit more cardinality than you could safely do with histograms. This ends up being much less data, being lower cardinality for Prometheus to deal with, and we can build a ratio like we have on the screen. So we've, we've taken this latency problem and we've turned it into a simple Boolean problem where we can build a ratio, look back over the past 30 days, see if that's less than 0.95 or, or 95%. And the best part of this is it's actually accurate. So that's a powerful trick for working with latencies in Prometheus. So we've looked at SLOs, but alerting on SLOs is problematic. A lot of people look at SLOs in a holistic sense. They look at the entire 30 days and they build alerts on, did we violate our SLO? And this has really poor reset time. When a problem happens, you page an engineer, the engineer comes on site, fixes the problem. The engineer, the, the business, want to see verification that the problem has been fixed and see that very quickly. With a holistic SLO approach to alerting, the alert doesn't resolve until that 30 day window elapses. And that doesn't give us the feedback we, know, we need to know that we fixed the problem. Detection time can also be really problematic. The SLO based alert doesn't fire until we've burned our entire error budget. So if this is a, a more subtle problem, this is a problem that may have existed for hours or days that's gone unnoticed. So I, I mentioned error budgets briefly. When we measure our SLO, we have a 95% goal. What is that other 5%? That other 5% is our error budget. It's our allowable margin for error. And we can measure how much of that we're using and use that to figure out you know, how risky can we be? Can we focus on new features or do we need to make sure our, our CI CD pipeline is super stable? The Google Site Reliability Engineering book talks about using burn rates as your alerting strategy. So what we're doing is we're looking at the rate at which we're consuming our error budget. And rather than looking back 30 days to figure out what our burn rate is, you can, that's perfectly valid, but you can also look back at smaller intervals like 30 minutes or an hour or three hours. And you can calculate you know, what the error ratio has been in the last hour divided by the error budget to get the error rate for the last hour. If we uh, compensate for our last hour compared to the total SLO time window, multiply that by our burn rate, we get the ratio of our error budget that we've consumed. This allows us to ask questions like this. We can build an alert that fires if we've consumed 2% of our error budget, so 2% of that 5% error budget within the last hour. All we need to do in this case is figure out what our burn rate is. 
we know what our budget consume ratio is going to be. We're looking back an hour. Our total time window is 30 days. So we solve that equation and we get 14.4. So let's look at some real examples. Again, I'm using my cheater method to measure latency SLOs here. So I'm looking at the, the total number of requests that took longer than our SLO to process over the last hour over the total number of requests in that last hour. Again, we sum by job. So anything that exports metrics in our standard format, this rule can handle. So this builds a recording rule that is a ratio of the requests that are over our SLO goal. We stick that into an alert rule and we ask the question, is that ratio greater than the burn rate we've calculated times our error budget? So 14.4 times our error budget of 5%. This alert fires if we've burnt 2% of our error budget in the last hour. So this indicates we probably have an emergent problem happening. We need to page an engineer and address the problem at hand. This alert clears very quickly when that problem is solved. And this alert fires before we've consumed all of our error budget, before we've broken our SLO. So we can react to changes that happen in an operational sense on the ground without putting at risk our SLO goals for the month. And that's really powerful. The Google SRE book um, covers this in much more detail. In fact, it covers a multiple burn rate method that you can use to identify highly critical problems uh, that you page somebody right away for versus more subtle issues that, you know, let's create a ticket and solve that Monday morning. So some takeaways from this. It's important to think about how you're going to use Prometheus, build a schema, and, and break down some of those silo barriers between team and keep those, those barriers broken down by working with teams to build a common way to use Prometheus across your fleet. Think about making rule libraries. Think about being able to automate away creating dashboards and Prometheus alerting. SLO-based measuring has a lot of really powerful aspects, um, but they're based on percentiles. And Prometheus is not great with working with percentiles. So once we understand the caveats there, we know how we can work around them. It's important to get your math right here and having someone that that knows the ins and outs here to make sure that you can make good business decisions uh, based on the data that you have is really super important. I think that SLOs, categor I, that SLOs categorize more into a report, which is something that's more aimed at, at informing the business. And it's something that we refer to you know, weekly, daily to figure out you know, how well we're doing. However, as far as operational alerting goes, you know, what's been happening in the fleet over the last hour, over the last three hours, using a burn rate style alerting pattern can give us much better, much better visibility um, into our fleet and help us meet our SLO goals going forward and keep moving iteration in, in a good direction. So I've handed over my presentation, so that should be available to folks as well. The Google Site Reliability Engineering books are available online for free. They're great reads. The uh, examples for burn rates are included in the Site Reliability Engineering Workbook, uh, which came out in 2018. I've also linked to the Monarch paper I referenced. You know, it doesn't describe how Monarch works internally to Google, but it tells us so much about the history there and so much about how Google thought about these very same problems and how they solve them. And that really kind of informs, you know, as we scale up, um, what to look for as far as, as challenges and problems. Again, my name is Jack Neely. I'm with 42lines.net. If you have any questions about this presentation, um, hit me up in chat. 
you can email me at 42 lines. You're welcome to ask us questions. Questions and answers are totally free. If you like this kind of content, I'm also the co-host along with Jared of the Practical Operations Podcast. Find us at operations.fm or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks a bunch. And Jared, if there are questions, I'll let you go at it. None just yet. You all have about 10 minutes, so no rush. And of course, someone moves their lawn as my presentation begins. Yeah, the mowers come out in force when we do a conference, especially virtual. There's a question uh, from Alejandro. I'm new to Prometheus. Is it comparable to Datadog and New Relic? It definitely has some of those features. Um, Prometheus is really targeted at uh, the metric side of the equation and less so at uh, events and logs, which uh, both of those uh, SAS vendors support both. Um, both of those SAS vendors have different strengths and weaknesses. And you know, this is what Jared and I have done with a couple of companies at this point is there comes a point where throwing everything at Datadog is just expensive. And being able to analyze where you are and what your goals are moving forward we can sort of put together a better strategy about you know, how we might use Prometheus and Elasticsearch locally for high volume, high cardinality and pair that with an external vendor um, to archive and handle the, the business metrics of things that are long-term important for a business. And that can often find some significant savings in, in your visibility stack. Jared, I'm going to let you take the next question. OK, um, so uh, another question is, uh, where is a good place to begin with Prometheus recommended sites to learn it? Actually, the Prometheus.io uh, website, their main website, has some great documentation. Uh, I go to that every time I need to reference for configuration changes and that kind of thing. Also, uh, Brian Brazil, one of the uh, core committers to Prometheus, he runs a blog on robustperception.io. Uh, I'll drop a link in the chat. Um, he blogs uh, about common problems that you run into with Prometheus, as well as uh, recently, or I guess for a while now, whenever there's a new version, he talks about uh, new features and how you might use them uh, that actually apply. Um, so those are some two great resources. But honestly, Prometheus is so simple. It's great just to download, and it will run on you know, Mac, Linux, Windows, just download it and just start ingesting data, even from Prometheus itself, and just play with it. It's a very approachable tool, and it's just something that takes uh, very little time to master. Uh, Jack, you want to take this one? Uh, does using local storage versus a remote storage integration have a large impact on queries? It can, depending on how large, how much data you're querying back and forth. Uh, the local storage is local on disk and memory mapped and really super efficient. Any sort of remote storage is going to be a network call away. And you know, if you're referencing um, S3 buckets or GCS buckets in, in the cloud, that can be pretty fast. Um, but there, there's definitely network calls involved there. So that's definitely something to think about. Also, um, if you use the SLO error count total counter ratio approach, how do you deal with labels when an error event hasn't been observed yet? You know, that's a great question that I've seen a lot. 
that many pe people have asked. And if you dig down deep enough into um, the Prometheus best practices, what they advise you do is, is try to pre-initialize all of your metrics and label combinations when your application starts. So your application starts, your and already exports a uh, error metric with a classification label, you know, 404 errors, and that's already set to zero. Uh, that can be a really important technique. Um, it doesn't always work in every case, um, but that's what I would suggest for first. There's some PromQL isms that we can use to, to help mitigate that as well. PromQL is, is pretty powerful as a language. Um, you can play the game of life in it, not for the faint of heart. Just a reminder, there are five minutes left. I see a question about um, or on vector. I could, but this is a really limiting way to deal with that question. Um, email me, jjneely at 42lines.net if it hasn't gotten into the chat yet. I can type, but it doesn't appear. Um, on top of what Jared said, there's a really healthy uh, Reddit for Prometheus, Prometheus Mo Monitoring. Um, and that's a great place as well to post questions you know, just like that and get some more in-depth information. Oh yeah, this is related to missing count initialization. Yeah, email me and I can probably um, help you more thoroughly than, than in the chat. Awesome, thank you. All right, if that's it, I guess we're out of here. Um, big thanks to Jared for helping me with uh, questions and moderations. And Ben, I really appreciate the, the moderators here at ETO. You guys have done a lot of work.